all of the Irma clients we have. You did pay attention. You did promise to be impartial. And you did pay attention to everything that transpired. Um, and although this may not seem like the most serious crimes, these may not seem like the most serious crimes in the world, they are to my client. And he takes them very seriously. And this matter has already had an effect on his life and will, or could, um, depending on, on the outcome, you know, as to his reputation, his career, his freedom. So thank you, all of you. And please forgive me. Last time I was like, you know, being free and, and speaking without referring to my notes, but I really don't want to miss anything. So um, you heard from several witnesses. You heard first from Officer Jet. He admitted to you, he was honest. He was very honest. He's a young police officer, didn't have a lot of experience at the time that he claims to have served my client with a temporary restraining order by telephone. And interestingly, my client left his home. He left his wife on July 4th, the shirt on his back. And you heard his testimony. And before I go any further, I will say, as the judge will say to you, and, and Ms. O'Brien perhaps also, that what I say and what Ms. O'Brien say are, are, are arguments. You know, what, it's what you believe, it's what you hear, it's what you've heard, it's what you've experienced, it's what your judgment tells you is the truth. So I wanted to lay that out there. My client left home on July 4th with a shirt on his back, tired of all the arguments with his wife. And you heard him tell you that you know, he told her, I'm not sure if I'm coming back. I may be back. Maybe we'll separate. Maybe we'll divorce. And he didn't come back on August 31st. And I submit to you, she was very angry. And we'll talk about her testimony when I get there, please. So she asked for a restraining order, a temporary restraining order, on August 31st. And my client isn't even served. And if you believe, that he was the person who was served by telephone by Officer Jen. He wasn't served until September 17th. But the individual who was served was served by telephone. And yes, that person said they were my client, but they could be anybody. They could have been my client's brother because he knew there was a restraining order. You heard my client testify to that. So Officer Jet was given a phone number. He didn't confirm. He didn't look on Google or anything to confirm whose phone number that was. He took it at face value. This is Herbert Reed's phone number. She calls whoever it was, talks to whoever it was, and said, you got a restraining order. And you can't have contact with your wife. You can't go home. You can't have guns. You can't have your weapons. But he, again, he never confirmed the phone. He didn't save the phone number. He didn't take notes. He didn't keep notes. And he told you, as a part of his training with the police academy, you're supposed to take notes. And you're supposed to keep your notes. You're supposed to preserve that. He admitted to you. He never spoken to Herbert Reed before that date or after that date. So he can't confirm that that's the voice of Herbert Reed who was talking to on that day. He didn't ask the person who he's talking to what his address was. He didn't ask for his email address. He could have sent my client a copy of the temporary restraining order. And in fact, you'll receive those documents because they've entered into they've been entered into evidence. And it's checked off that he provided him with a copy, but we know that he didn't. Never happened. He also testified that the person he talked to on the phone said they'd come to the police station the next day. They didn't. And I submit to you because it wasn't Herbert Reed, it was somebody else. I'm not submitting to you that Officer Jack is lying. I'm not. To the contrary. He seemed like he was testifying honestly before all of you, and he took this very seriously. But he's human, and he admitted he could have made a mistake, and he admitted he didn't keep his notes, and he admitted he didn't send my client a copy, even though it says on the document that the prosecutor has that he was provided, my client was provided with a copy. I submit to you my client was, was not served on that date. Now, you heard from Officer Sawyer. Again, Officer Sawyer, I submit to you, testify honestly to you. Believe that she's a good, honorable, honest police officer doing her job. She testified 
that my client presented himself to the Pemberton Township Police Department on November 14, 2018. But she didn't see him when he got there. Another officer whose name is Laffin did. And Officer Laffin presented my client. He provided him with a copy of the temporary restraining order that my client acknowledges receiving. He received it in person. And the question to ask, please ask yourselves, if my client was served with a temporary restraining order by Officer Jett on September 17th, why would he need to be served again with the same order on November 14th? Now, Ms. O'Brien is going to tell you uh, that Ms. Bly, who works with the Family Division, again, a good, honest, respectable, respectful witness, told you the process of how things work. But she also told you that she didn't serve Mr. Reed. She can't confirm he was served. And she also confirmed what the prosecutor asked her about. If there are any errors whatsoever on these documents, they've got to be reissued. And it can even, it can even be a typographical error. Because we know from Officer Jett, that Officer Jett claims that whoever he talked to on the phone, he told, can't have contact with Simone Seymour, can't go to the residence, can't have weapons, you've got to turn them in. So, on the day that my client goes to the police station on November 14th, Officer Lappin gives him a copy of the temporary restraining order, and he advises him of the terms, the terms again. Can't have contact with your wife, can't go to your residence, and if you want to go to get any of your things, you need to have an escort, which my client advised you already knew because he's in law enforcement. You can't have weapons. You've got to turn your weapons in. And at that point, if my client had gone to his home, as alleged, on October 1st, and if he had removed his guns on October 1st, wouldn't he know his guns are not in the house anymore? Wouldn't he know that? He would and he would have hightailed it out of the police station because he'd be in big trouble. But he didn't do that. He asked instead to be escorted to the house to get his personal belongings because he didn't plan to go home. He planned to stay out, to leave, and to move on with his life. So he waits a half hour for Officer Sawyer. Officer Sawyer, before she meets, she, she, he was free to go to his residence by himself, and she met him there. She asked him, do you have any guns? He said, yeah, absolutely, I have guns. And he gave her a list of every single weapon he owned. And he owned quite a few. Because he likes guns, because he's a corrections officer, because he's an expert at using them, because he's taught his son, who's now a proud detective, and the son he's very proud of, knows how to use them, and, and is instructing people on their use. And he also taught his wife how to use guns, so she'd be comfortable with them and familiar with them. So if he had gone to his house on October 1st, why? Why would he stay there on November, not October, yeah, October 1st, why would he stay there on November 14th after being given the temporary restraining order, knowing that he took the guns out on October 1st? Does that make any sense to you? I submit to you it makes absolutely no sense, especially when he waits a half hour, he meets with Officer Sawyer. Officer Sawyer asks my client, do you have weapons? He tells her exactly every single weapon he has, where they can be found. You know, the handguns, I think, are in the safe, in the, the bedroom, in the bedroom, master bedroom closet that he shared with his wife. The rifles are chained on hooks um, in the master bedroom closet that he shared with his wife. And we know that his wife had access to them. We know that, not just from my client's testimony, but from their sons, the detective, um, Prince, Prince Reed. So we know that. And so he tells Officer Sawyer where they can be found. Officer Sawyer goes up to Simone Seymour and says, can you show me where the weapons are? And Simone Seymour says, well, you know, they're not there anymore, but I'll show you where they were. And Simone Seymour leads her into the bedroom into the closet where Officer Sawyer observes that the safe is wide open. It's open. Now, if my client had been there on uh, October 1st and removed the weapons, he could have closed the safe. But even more importantly, if he was there on October 1st and removed the guns, would that safe door still be open? Would it be open six weeks later? Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you that Simone Seymour said, oh, the weapons aren't there, but Officer Sawyer admitted to you an error that she made in her 
in her police work because she's human. She admitted she didn't ask Simone Seymour if she did anything with the weapons, if she knew where they were, if she put them somewhere. She didn't do that. She just assumed that my client lied to her. So she calls the prosecutor's office after, you know, talking to, I think, the sons or whatever, and um, has my son arrested. My son has my client arrested. If Herbert Reed had removed his guns on October 1st, as alleged, he would have been a nervous wreck, and he wouldn't have stayed at the police office. He was calm, he was polite, and he was cooperative, exactly the way he was on the stand, although I'll tell you, I, I would say he probably is nervous because of what he's facing here, but he was calm, cool, and collected, and Officer Sawyer told you that. my client noted that the guns were missing. On that day, November 14th, what did he do? He reported them missing or stolen. If he had gotten rid of his guns, if he had sold them, if he had done anything with them and he didn't any longer possess them, he would not have still had that, that index card. Inventorying his weapons and their serial numbers in the wallet uh, in which he carries his badge for his job as a corrections officer. There's no need for him to still have it. And he couldn't have reported them missing before that because he had no idea they were missing. Simone Seymour testified yesterday. And it's clear that she wasn't comfortable on the stand. She wasn't happy being here. In fact, she took a phone call, which is a first that I've ever seen with any witness on the stand. But she reluctantly admitted that Herbert left her at some point during that summer, but she couldn't tell you when, or she didn't tell you when. And we know that she requested a temporary restraining order on August 31st. She told you that she was provided a copy of that temporary restraining order by the court, because she had to come to the court to get it. Excuse me. She had to come to the court to get it, so she knew what the terms and conditions were. <coughs> she knew that my client couldn't come to the home, that he couldn't have contact with her, that he couldn't have his weapons, and he'd have to turn them in. She knew that. But she didn't think, and she said, I don't think he was served on September 17th, exactly what my client told you. She didn't think he was served. And she was not advised by the court that he was served or he knew what the terms were. And she also said that she had no knowledge of my client returning to the home after he left, which is contrary to what her son said. She said the first time, and she wasn't, I mean, so we're assuming that if you believe that my client went to his home on October 1st, maybe Simone Seymour wasn't there. But um, she said the first time she saw him was November 14th when he had that escort by the police. Initially, and, and when, I, when she was questioned, she denied knowing whether the safe in her closet, in her master bedroom, where she has her clothes, she denied knowing if it was open or closed on November 14th. When Officer Sawyer went in there and looked and saw it wide open, she denied it was open. She said, I don't know if it was open or closed. Is she telling you the truth? She denied knowing anything about uh, the guns. She denied having access to the guns. We know that that's not true. That's a lie. She had access to the guns. She had a key to the safe. She shot with those guns. She knew what to do with the guns. And she also was asked several times by Ms. O'Brien, was your house burglarized? No, my house wasn't burglarized. Did you have jewelry or anything, um, anything stolen of importance? No, but she says the guns are gone. Well, if you have guns in your house and they're missing, and you know they're missing, and you did not remove them from your house, wouldn't you call the police? Wouldn't you? She didn't. And common sense tells me, and I hope it tells you too, that the reason she did is because she's the one who removed the guns. She put them somewhere, and we don't know where they are. Because she's the one who's lived there. She's the one who was there every single day. 
from July 4th through November 14th. The safe is wide open. She knows the guns are gone, but eh, not even call the police. I submit to you, she's the one who removed the guns. And now, I submit to you on the, on the stand, even under oath, she's afraid perhaps she'll get in trouble if she admits that she's the one who removed the guns. You heard the testimony of both of my client's sons, Prince Reed and Lord Reed. Two young men, and they had, they have a third son together as well, who just graduated from high school, who's starting college, studying real estate. My client is very proud of both of his sons. He raised two wonderful young men. One is going to be a nurse soon, and the older one is a detective, and he credits his father a thousand percent with having the career that he has and being the young man who he is. And he's articulate. And he was calm and he was collected, but he didn't want to be here. Neither of them wanted to be here. Both sons testified, as did my client, that my client raised them to always put their mother first, no matter what. So the example that was given to them was that, that they told them, if there is a bus that's out of control and it's, and it's speeding towards your mother and me, and you can only save one of us to save your mother. Well, that speeding bus did it. And they saved their mother. And here's the result of the bus hitting him. He's here on trial. Because they did what they were told to do. And they were put in a very, very bad, ugly, awkward situation. Of yes, lying for their mother. Yes, feeling they had to lie for their mother. Because they were always told, put your mother first. And Lord, the younger of the two, still lives with his mother. How uncomfortable is that? To still be living with your mother and know that this is, is going on. And I think both of them, I know for sure that Prince noted that this has really, really destroyed the family, this whole incident. I submit to you that both sons, neither of them expected that this case would go this far, that anything would come of any of this. When they told the police what they told the police about October 1st. And I submit to you they were lying on behalf of their mother to protect their mother. And I, I submit to you that they now regret that, which is why they very reluctantly came to court and tried to backpedal from their testimony. And you heard uh, Prince say, you know, when we would go to the shooting range, my father would put all the weapons in this big black box or tub or whatever it was. And that's how he transported the guns. He did not say, if my, if my client was there on October 1st, as I submit to you respectfully, he wasn't. He would have taken the guns out in that tub. He didn't. And I submit to you, he wasn't there. Simone Seymour was asked by me, could you get into the safe? Oh, no, I couldn't get into the safe. Didn't you have a key to the safe? Oh, no, I didn't have a key to the safe. Well, we know the safe was wide open on November 14th when she led the police officer into her bedroom, into that closet. And we know from the son, as well as my client, that she did have a key to the safe. She did have access to the guns. She could have taken them out. When I asked her about the temporary restraining order, what did she say? She said, restraining order? What restraining order? Why are we talking about a restraining order? If you remember her testimony, that's what she said. Because I think I can only surmise that now perhaps she regrets all of this. She was not happy to be here either. I submit to you that there was a handwritten statement by Lord, the younger son. And I submit to you, and he said, oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember being there. Very uncomfortable about the whole thing. I submit to you perhaps that handwritten statement was because his mother told him what to say. That's what I submit respectfully, what you believe is what you believe, and these are the, those are the facts, what you believe them to be. He referred to his Uncle Carrie, however, he really knows his Uncle Carrie is his Uncle Billy, but in the statement, in the handwritten statement, he wrote Carrie. That's my client's older brother, or younger brother, yeah. his younger brother, who they claim came to the house with my client October 1st. However, you didn't hear Carrie Reed testified. He wasn't here to testify at this trial to tell you that he took my client to his house on October 1st. I submit to you that, again, 
Lord Reed, when he gave that statement, had no idea this was going to go anywhere, and that he would end up having to testify twice with regard to this matter. And he was very uncomfortable with it. And I believe, I, I submit to you that he was telling the truth this time, that, you know, nothing happened. I don't know. We heard from Prince Reed, the detective, the successful, and he is a very successful young man. How many people make it to detective by the age of 27? That's quite an accomplishment. And he owes his father. He says it's all because of his father, how his father raised him and his brothers. To be respectful, respectable, honest, honorable, and to learn how to shoot guns. And I think he, he instructs people at the uh, rifle range or the gun range as an officer. And he clearly did not want to be here. And he told you honestly that this is a terrible, awful rift that's been created in the family because of the bickering of the fighting, not the physical fighting, the verbal fighting between his mother and father. And that, 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 that his father told him, always put your mother first. And he admitted that's what he did. He put his mother first because that's what he was told he had to do. So I submit to you that the statement that he gave about October 1st, he told because of his mother. And he wasn't truthful about that. My client wasn't there. My client testified, you just heard his testimony. You know what he said. And you know, interestingly, I did not expect my client to say this. And when he was, and I asked him, I think I asked him, you know, you, you take credit for the way your sons have turned out. And he said, it's not just me, it's the mother too. That says a lot about him as a person, even with all of this ugliness, even with all the ugliness with his wife, he still gives her credit for the good things she did and brought to the family in raising their children together. And he told you, he's been a corrections officer for many years, 23 years at the time of this incident. Doesn't have a record. Objection, Your Honor. Okay, I, I will take back that statement because I, was, I didn't answer that. It's stricken. All right. Disregard. That's true. Um, he is an honorable, honest, working man, a corrections officer. He was on that date. And he denies all of this. And he said, if I, if I had removed those guns on October 1st as accused, I wouldn't have waited around. I would have left when I was served the restraining order on November 14th by Officer Lavin. But he waited. He waited for Officer Sawyer to get his items and also to get the guns to turn over. And he was very honest again about what he had. He told her there was the card with all the serial numbers. And he wasn't nervous, not the least bit. Why? Because he didn't expect that the guns would not be there. He was surprised they weren't there. So my client is charged with contempt. Contempt of a restraining order that we don't even know was in existence on September 17th, or should I say, before November 14th, when we know he was served for sure. So he's charged with contempt by violating a restraining order that we don't even know he was served with. He denies he was served with it, and it makes sense, respectfully, that he wasn't served with it, because if he was, when he was advised to come to the police station on November 14th, he would have said, I was already served, I know about it. But he went to be served on November 14th. So I submit to you, he did not violate that restraining order. First of all, he never went to the home on October 1st. So I respectfully submit to you. And even if he did, but he didn't, he wasn't served with the restraining order in the first place. And the second charge is obstruction of the administration of law. He's accused of lying to the police about the guns, about what happened to the guns, about where the guns were. How can you be guilty of something that you don't even know anything about? And I submit to you, again, and I know I'm repeating myself a thousand times, and my husband will be sitting there laughing at me, because that's what I do. But he did not remove the guns on any day before November 14th. He didn't. If he did, why would he be there on November 14th, and why would he be so calm, cool, and collected? He didn't. Somebody else did. And I submit to you that somebody else was Simone Seymour. I said during my opening, Maybe I shouldn't have said this. If I was a guy, I probably wouldn't say that she's a woman scorned, because women hate to hear that. Right? But I submit to you, she's a woman scorned. 
You know, they, they fought their whole marriage. Their whole marriage, apparently, they fought, they beggared, and it just reached the point on July 4th, after shooting off the Walmart fireworks, an argument over his oldest child, his daughter, with another woman, that that was it. He was done, and he left. And I submit to you, we don't know, but I submit to you that she expected him to come home and things would continue on whatever path they were continuing on. But he decided not to come home. And so she got angry, and she asked for the restraining order. And all of this came about because of that. And out of her anger, and out of being hurt, and out of being scorned, she had her son's lie on her behalf to protect her because she's the one who removed the guns. Now, the judge advised you and will advise you again. My client does not have to prove his innocence. In fact, in fact, my client did not have to take the stand. He didn't have to, but he chose to because he wanted to tell you his version of the events. He voluntarily chose to, and it's your perception that counts, not mine, not Ms. O'Brien's, but I submit to you respectfully that he was being truthful with you. So my client didn't have to prove his innocence, but I, I, I believe his testifying helped do that. It's the state, it's the prosecutor, who must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that my client is guilty of these charges. It's her duty and her duty alone. Now, what is reasonable doubt? Well, if you think my client, well, you know, with all of that testimony all over the place, and some of it was all over the place, you know, well, he could have done it. Could have isn't good enough. You believe he could have done it. You must find him not guilty because there's reasonable doubt. Think he might have done it? Might have again, not good enough. That's not good enough. There's reasonable doubt. You must find my client not guilty. And even if you believe he probably did what he's accused of, probably is not good enough if you find that there's reasonable doubt. You must find my client not guilty. And I respectfully submit to each and every one of you that my client is an innocent man wrongly charged. I please ask you to find him not guilty of the charges. Thank you.